Hello, everybody. Welcome to our second day of sessions at Beam College. Um, we have a packed day with lots of stuff, and we will start with some hardcore stuff. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here with Reza Rockney and Ahmed Altai. Uh, Reza joining us from Singapore. I'm joining us from uh, U.S. West Coast. So we have we are saying that we have quite a large gap of time zones between our instructors today. So thank you very much for being so late, Reza, and so early, Amit. Well, it's actually um, it's actually early for me now because I'm now in Friday. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 Thank you. So, uh, okay, let's start. We will be uh, doing a, a collab. Uh, this is a hands-on practical session demo slash hands-on lab. So uh, Reza will explain how to open the collab. And without further ado, uh, please carry on. Yes, thank you very much uh, for that intro. And uh, uh, Ahmed is, uh, will be helping us with questions and stuff as we progress. Um, so in order to, to access the CoLab and follow along uh, as I go through this, um, you can go to the site that you've been uh, provided and under day two, go to uh, B1 Beam College in this rather long file name that I've chosen to use. Um, in order to open this, uh, you can actually right click and open in a new tab. I understand if you actually try and open it within here, it's quite a big file, it, it doesn't open. So if you right click and open a new tab, it should open up in uh, Code Lab and you can then follow along. Oh, I'll just reconnect here. So um, uh, what we have done here is try to do something slightly different just because normally with windows and, and triggers and uh, the complexity of how that all interacts with the watermarks, um, it, it can be quite a steep learning curve. And we often do sort of conceptual slides and then we do the, the, the labs. In this one, we try to put everything together. So it is a long notebook. I'm not sure if we're gonna get all the way to the end by the end of the session, but hopefully it's standalone so you could you could continue if you wanted to. Um, the, uh, uh, the other part of this is there is a lot of writing on this notebook. You don't need to read it as I'm scrolling uh, through. I'm actually gonna be walking through things and, and going through the, the various cell points. Uh, sell uh, uh, code pieces. Um, in terms of uh, what we're going to cover, so we're going to start on some basics around timestamps and sources, um, looking at how we can introspect various elements within uh, the pipeline, uh, give you some tools for around how you do debugging and actually try to reason out what this pipeline is doing. Uh, we're gonna look at how windows are assigned um, and we're gonna do that firstly, mostly in a batch uh, simulation. Um, after that, we're going to move to some more advanced stuff, which is uh, on the stream processing side. We're going to talk about event time, processing time, look a little bit at the watermarks, et cetera. And for that, we're going to be simulating a streaming pipeline using the test stream uh, utility. Um, uh, for this, to help save time, I've actually pre-run all of the cells for my code there. But of course, uh, if you wanted to try that yourselves, you could just run them as, as we go. When you come to do the setup one, um, on the install, you might find there are some errors. Um, they should be benign, and if you continue and click onto the rest of the cells, everything should be fine. Um, so we'll, we'll skip past these first two, which are just the setup and some imports. So let's start lots going through this and thinking about timestamps and, and how that's assigned there on, basis, on various sources. Um, so for the very first one, we're going to do a batch pipeline. And Throughout this code lab, we're going to make use of a simple data set. Um, what we're going to simulate is stock ticks from the stock market. Um, these would normally come with a value, for example, $1.05, an instrument, which is just a, a, a string identifier, and a timestamp. Um, so that's the values that we're going to use and we're going to put into this array. If you notice, for now, I am not putting in any timestamp information. Um, the array happens to have these ticks that have come from the market in the correct order. So the order is correct within this array. Um, and uh, we have a uh, value for the instrument ID of being A. 
Uh, essentially, we're going to ignore that from this point onwards because there is only one value. All the computations and aggregations we're going to do is only going to be for one key. And we've done that to just keep things nice and simple. So the first thing that we, we do is a beam pipeline. So hopefully from day one, uh, you'll be familiar with this. With the beam pipeline as P, um, we are going to uh, create, use the create transform, which uh, allows us to use this array of information. And of course, um, even though I put all the information into this array ordered, the moment we use create, it's going to create a P collection of unordered data. So we can no longer rely on the order that existed in the array. This will then be sent to the transform that we're going to use throughout this process, which is a combiner. It's going to aggregate everything up and count the number of elements uh, uh, per key. Um, in this particular instance, there is only one key. There are six elements in here. And the output that we'd expect from this is to be six. So uh, as I said, I've, I've already run these before. The count is six is the output that we have. Um, we can ignore these final two transforms. These are just to pretty up our uh, results. Um, now, we didn't provide any timestamp or windowing information in this little uh, batch pipeline. However, Beam always assigns windows and timestamps. And uh, for us to be able to look at this data a little bit more closely and introspect the elements in more detail, we need a little bit of help from us on helper functions. And for that, I've created a uh, couple of utilities that we're going to use throughout the process. So I'll spend a couple of minutes talking about this. Um, the get element timestamp is uh, a class for uh, is a, a do fun that we've created. Um, we'll ignore this particular piece for now, which is a pain info. So this is a do fun that we created. And in the process piece, we are accessing various pieces of information. Uh, and these tools are very useful whenever you're looking at uh, why a, a pipeline might be acting strange or uh, why things aren't behaving the way you do uh, you were thinking. I usually do my stuff in Java. The same is available in Java as well. So the first uh, piece, the timestamp, gives us the timestamp of the element, uh, the timestamp that's been associated with that element. Uh, the second will give us the window that that element has been assigned to. Um, and by the way, there are use cases where you actually make use of these values outside of just looking and testing. So you may you make use of these values within the do fun itself. For example, with time series, which I work with a lot, um, uh, we make use of that quite heavily. Uh, the rest of this uh, do fun is just producing sort of pretty output for us uh, to look at when we are um, running the, the, the tests. Um, so we can ignore the rest of these uh, for now. The pretty print function, um, just to spend a couple of minutes on one item on here, what we do during the, this whole process, we um, are uh, outputting the values. We collect everything into a list. Um, so everything that's being produced by our pipeline, we collect into a list. And then we print it after sorting it. So I just wanted to highlight this because all the output you're going to see is going to look sorted, and everything's going to be done by uh, timestamp. So it's all going to look very, very clean. Um, however, just important to note, it's only because we've manually done this sort to make the output pretty. Um, normally, it's not going to be sorted, and the peak collection is unordered. OK. Um, so uh, with that, let's now go back to our uh, array of values, our values here. And before we run the count again, let's actually just use our get element timestamp and pretty print them. So we run this function against that data. And what we can see is that even though we provided no time information, um, the create source has associated a timestamp to every single element, which is this rather large negative number. And it's put them into the global window. Now, what the source has done is assigned negative infinity to uh, the timestamp, negative infinity being defined as um, within Beam as the, the beginning of the, the, the global window here. Um, and we can actually see that value. Um, so again, in the next cell, um, we're going to create a global window object. And I output its start and end. And we can see that the value uh, from the start matches the value that we have uh, above, which is was what was the source attached to that timestamp. So everything is always within a window. And now let's start manipulating those values and adding different windows uh, to things. So 
what kind of timestamps could be associated with elements? So obviously sources are free to attach timestamps other than negative infinity. And for unbounded sources like Google Cloud PubSub IO or uh, PubSub or Kafka, um, there are several options. So with PubSub, um, the default is if you put an element into the Publish and Subscribe API's topic, um, then the time that you put that element in, it becomes the processing time. It becomes the element time. So essentially, the processing time is the, the element time. Um, there are ways of actually passing in uh, metadata about the uh, element itself. So rather than the time when the system sees that element, it becomes the actual time that the uh, data point was created in the real world. We'll come back to these uh, a little bit later. For now, we're going to stick with our batch pipeline. So what I want to do is actually provide more information to that batch pipeline about the time that the uh, stop ticks actually occurred. To do that, I will make use of the timestamp value um, uh, object, which takes a value of type any and a timestamp of uh, type time. And the way we're going to organize our data, so we have uh, for the $1.05 value at the beginning, we're going to set that to be at 10 o'clock. Um, there are a couple of values that are at uh, one second past. Uh, and then there is a gap between the value that is at three second pass and eight seconds pass. Um, the next cell, I don't need to go into the details of this one. Essentially, all we're doing is creating timestamp value objects with the characteristics that we've described in this table. Um, and when we output that, we see that, for example, $1.05 for that first element has been assigned to uh, 10 a.m. Now that we've got these timestamp values, let's actually put them into our pipeline and in our batch pipeline and make use of them along with a fixed window. So the fixed window is going to create fixed windows of time uh, at, at uh, discrete uh, intervals. And the way that our data is going to shape up as it gets tagged into these different windows. So these are um, these gray boxes will be the window. Um, so we will have windows, uh, because we're going to create fixed windows of one second, um, we're going to have one value in the first window. Um, there'll be two values in the second window, uh, and uh, so on. Um, in terms of the graphic, the blue are our elements and the, the timestamp for those elements. And we'll use this graphic uh, uh, in a couple of other places as well. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. And uh, we are going to apply our window by using window into function. This will create a fixed window of one second. And we are then going to just output the, the information about the timestamp and which window they've been assigned to uh, in, in this um, uh, pipeline. So when we do that, we can actually see our values now have the timestamps that we would expect. And they have been assigned to uh, the windows that we describe above. An important part of the Beam uh, model to understand, this can catch folks out, is even though these elements have all been tagged with a timestamp and put into a window, no grouping has been done at this point. So for example, these two values uh, are just independent elements at the moment. They're not grouped together in any way. Um, because Beam uh, won't do the grouping until we do a group by key or combine function. So this graphic is from the Apache Beam website. And we can see if we replace uh, our create source with Kafka, we're applying our windows. When we are outputting this information, we're still within a par do. So there's no grouping happening there. Only in the group by key does that grouping function actually happen. OK. Um, so now that we've got our fixed windows and we've seen, seen what the data looks like, let's run this through an aggregation, which is our count operation. So here we have our fixed window. And now we're going to run it on count per key. And of course, this is now going to do it per key per window. So before, when we did the count, there was going to be six elements, because that was all the elements in the system. Now there's going to be a count per key. And um, the output that we see here, and I've uh, gone ahead and uh, tabulated that output to make it a little bit easier to read. This, is, this output here is essentially the values that we see up here. So this was our original data set. And we can see that when we're counting, we have got an element coming out of the count operation with the value 1 for the first one, 2 uh, for the second, et cetera. One piece that's interesting, going back to the actual raw output, is these timestamp values. So the output of the count operation itself is an element, of course. 
And that will be, uh, uh, have a timestamp associated with it uh, outside of the, which is what the transform, the count transform was given. Um, and that value is actually here, it's the end of the window. And that's the default value. It's, 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 it's the normal and it's the one that uh, is relevant in, in nearly all use cases. There are occasions in, more, in some specific use cases where you may want to change that value not to be the end of the window, but some other point in the window. And there is some capability of doing this uh, by using a timestamp combiner. So in this uh, pipeline, which is uh, a carbon copy of the previous pipeline, with the exception of in the window function, we provided a timestamp combiner and the value we've chosen is output at earliest. So whereas the default is the end of the window, here we're asking to output the earliest timestamp seen. To be specific, we are not, this doesn't mean that it's gonna output with a timestamp at the beginning of the window, it's going to output with a timestamp of the first element ever seen in that window. Um, and the running this with our uh, counts and output, we actually see our values have now changed from the end of the window to the big to uh, the, the timestamp of the first element in the window. Um, and thinking about this, I should have actually maybe made those uh, values a little bit higher than the beginning. So you can actually see that here. Uh, but that what is, is the way that you would manipulate those uh, values. Okay, so up to now, we've been doing um, all of this in batch. Uh, let's now move into a more simulating a stream pipeline and, and see some of the different interesting things that arrive there. So what's the difference between stream and batch here? Um, well, first of all, in the batch pipeline, we had all of the data available all at once. And as long as we were providing explicit information about the timestamps, they would all end up in the correct windows. We'd get perfect counts all the time. Uh, as we know, with unbounded data, the data is going to be continuously arriving. We need to figure out when we should close a window and output a value. Uh, we may have data coming out of sequence or data arriving late. Uh, things are gonna start getting messy. So how do we do uh, accurate computing and processing of those counts when the data is unbounded? Um, if, we, if we look at this graphic in, in, in a, a little bit more detail, just because we're gonna use it a little bit later on, um, the uh, x-axis here is the processing time. So when our system is aware of data coming, uh, or has been made aware of an element enter, uh, uh, being processed, and uh, these are all the elements flowing through the system. The values within the elements, so when they are seen in the real world here for these three elements that we have highlighted was 8 a.m. So these two arrived roughly around uh, when we get to see them was around the same time as when they were created. This particular one arrives much later. And examples of this would be, you know, a mobile application that's sending clickstream, it loses connectivity, and when it comes back online, um, it sends the data. So now we've got this idea of late data arriving out of order data. How does the system know when to output and how to deal with these things? So the way that um, Beam does that is with the, the, the watermarks and uh, just a little bit more intuition on that. Um, uh, in this graph, the event time, in other words, when something happened in the real world is on the x-axis. Uh, on the y-axis is the processing time when we get to see the uh, thing. If we were, um, uh, if as an event happened, we immediately saw it in our processing system, we would get into this ideal line situation here. So uh, of course, that never happens in any uh, uh, real system. There's always a lag between when uh, we, this thing happens in the real world and we get to process it. And of course, more importantly, that lag is never consistent. So it's going to uh, increase and decrease based on various things like machines falling behind, machines falling over, et cetera. Uh, and this essentially is, is roughly the watermark. Um, uh, and uh, one of the, uh, technical leads uh, early on uh, uh, taught me this intuition, which I think is very useful, is a watermark is our estimation of the data that we'll see into the future. Um, essentially with Beam, what it does is going to have this notion of tracking uh, the data. And once it's uh, certain that it's got all the data within a, 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 that it's expecting to arrive in a certain window, it's going to output um, a, a value. Um, the, uh, the watermark itself, the, a pipeline has different stages and water, the, each stage can have its own uh, watermark. Once the data is in the pipeline, it, we can actually track the watermark perfectly because different stages within the pipeline, and we'll come to a graphic in a moment that will help with this, 
Different stage in the pipeline will know all of the data that is in the system as a whole and will know where they've got to. However, for our sources, these are always going to be an estimation. Um, so uh, we estimate the watermark on our sources. In terms of what does it mean to have different watermarks in different parts of the pipeline? So let's imagine we have a pipeline where we're reading from two unbounded sources and we are carrying out various transforms. Each one of these transforms can have its own watermark, input watermark and output watermark. Um, for uh, this side, the, uh, the, the, the A is an unbounded source and we're going to estimate um, uh, the watermark there. Uh, C will be uh, its watermark is going to its input watermark is going to be uh, the output watermark from A. Um, e is output watermark is going to be the oldest of uh, the ones from C and D. And of course, it's the oldest because if either of the, any of the stages upstream of it are at, at, at a certain watermark, E can't progress until uh, the, the the watermark is progressed upstream of it. Now, to actually simulate some of this stuff in uh, our code, we're going to make use of another utility class, um, which is the test stream uh, class. Now, uh, with test stream, uh, so we're going to create a test stream object here. What test stream allows us to do is allows us to very precisely model a data arriving and moving of the watermark uh, manually so that we can get a consistent stream to run all our experiments through. Uh, the way we use it is we create the test stream object. And um, at this point, we're going to advance the watermark on the test stream uh, to 10 uh, AM. We then insert a value. And please note, I've deliberately not inserted a timestamp value. I've actually just inserted a raw value without any time information. So at this point, other than where it's been inserted into the stream, Beam won't have any uh, a notion of the event time for this particular uh, piece. It's just going to use the time that it was inserted into the stream. Um, so at 10 o'clock, we have this one. And we move the watermark by one second. We apply our other elements, and so on until the end. Finally, the test stream, we need to close it off by um, advancing the watermark to infinity. OK. Um, with the test stream object, so now we're going to use that within our uh, a pipeline. So we're going to use our test stream. One thing about test stream, you can't keep reusing it. You have to create a new test stream because it will exhaust it when you write through the pipeline. Uh, just something that um, uh, to, that'll catch it folks out. Um, so uh, we're going to use the test stream, uh, and we are going to uh, run our fixed window against it. And um, uh, we're going to do our get element timestamp to look at the, the, the timestamps that's been associated with the values. Here we can actually see, um, and we'll go to the table, which is just uh, uh, shows these, these value a little bit easier. We see that the actual table is an exact match for the data that we had previously around event time. So it looks like it's done a perfect thing. Well, the reason for that is we have been very, very careful in creating the test stream to make it perfect. We didn't put any data out of order. Um, we moved the watermark carefully as we inserted elements. Therefore, the processing time will be matched exactly the, the event time in this case. Of course, real systems don't do that. Real unbounded sources aren't going to be like that. It's going to be out of order and late data. And to uh, uh, just to finish this before we add some uh, variance into that test stream, I do the I, uh, for this same test stream that we had above, we do the count operation. So now I'm going to count and output our results. As we would expect, because we've carefully crafted this test stream, um, the results are as before, and everything is looking OK. All right, so let's now um, put in some real world uh, problems in, into our test stream. What we're going to do, similar to the graphic that we saw before, where there was some late data, we're going to introduce late data into the test stream. Um, this was our previous data set. And what we're going to do is insert a new data element, which is corresponding to uh, 10 o'clock, uh, dead, and add that after eight seconds into our test stream. So here, everything in this code is the same as the cell above, with the exception of this final line, where we've added this $1.09 value um, as late data that arriving after the watermark has been moved to eight seconds. OK, um, what we're going to do is account and uh, get element timestamp. When you run this, we're going to get these results, which I have uh, represented in this table here. And we now notice that we have this incorrect value. Um, 
the count at that final window has now moved to two instead of being one. So that value has gone and ended up in the wrong window. And that's not surprising because we didn't give the uh, system any other information other than the processing time. So uh, this is what the system saw. It saw this late data come in into the final window and it's applied the count there. How do we actually get it to more correctly do our processing for us? Well, based off what we've seen before in the create event, we need to give it event time. And by the way, um, so for sources like PubSub and, and, and things like Kafka, as well as the processing time, as we mentioned earlier, you can provide event time. So with PubSub IO, this is through the timestamp ID value. Essentially, this is metadata that you can give to PubSub and that will, and the PubSub will then pass that metadata onto your, your pipeline when you use that ID value. Um, in order to simulate this in our test stream, we're gonna make use of test data, uh, test, sorry, timestamp value again. Um, so in our timestamp uh, test stream, we have our, as before, we're advancing the watermark and we are uh, adding elements. But in this time, in, in, sorry, in this instance, we are going to add timestamp value elements to this stream. Um, and we're going to provide a timestamp of start, uh, which is the, the same up here. And we're going to also increment the timestamp as we move uh, these value forward. Finally, for our late data item, we are also including the start time. So our late data item is now being added at the end uh, of this uh, test stream, but the timestamp value is the correct timestamp for that element. So if we were to run this against our get element timestamp to introspect the, the information, we can now see that we have a new value added, which is this $1.09, and it's got the correct window associated with it and the correct timestamp. Okay, so let's run this through our count. So let's do an aggregation now. So this data exists here. We're going to do a fixed window of one second. We're gonna do our per key as per normal and uh, look at the output. So again, this is the output. I've, I've made it uh, uh, nicely in this table here. We can see that the value at eight, uh, that window between eight and uh, just before eight is correct. It's no longer two. Uh, so that late data element is not there. But we have this late data element value here. However, the count for um, the window at the beginning is still only one, not two. Now, why is that? Well, the default for uh, Beam is it, to drop late data. So if the watermark has passed and the fixed window has emitted the pane of information, um, the default is to drop late data and not include it in, uh, and not output in any further uh, computations, which may be the right thing that you would need for your business use case. Or um, uh, you, you may actually need that value. So even though it's coming in late, you want to see it downstream. So how do we do that? Well, um, we can actually change the window into function and allow lateness um, uh, gives us the time to allow after the window closes when data is still going to be processed by the system. In this case, 10 seconds. So that would mean any data that comes in after 10 seconds after that window closes um, is going to be processed in event time. Uh, anything after 10 seconds will still be treated as part of the default and that data will be dropped. So now when we run this count pipeline, we can see that we have this new entry added, which is uh, again at 10 and it contains one element. So um, in this table, we have that first element that was added. The late data element is also being output now. Uh, now this may, Again, cover the use case um, uh, where you're now seeing this late data also downstream. However, sometimes we don't just want to see the late data. We want to um, have uh, output which is correct based on the total count for the elements that would have been within that window, for example, if they hadn't arrived late. So um, if we think about it, there are, uh, actually, I'll go back quickly. So the value here, that is that late data, we actually want to include it in this window and include it in the count. So that count to become two. So why didn't Dataflow do that automatically for us? Uh, sorry, uh, uh, Beam didn't do that automatically for us uh, uh, here. The def and to, to explain that, we need to introduce one new uh, uh, thing, which is panes. 
Um, so, uh, uh, and I really should have had a graphic here to explain panes, but essentially uh, for every window, a window can output one or more panes of, uh, 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 from the window. Um, uh, up until now, we've mostly been seeing on-time panes. So there are three types of uh, panes that can come out. So after the watermark trigger is fired, we've been seeing the values come out. This final value that we see here is actually the late pane. So this is, a, uh, uh, instead of on time, there is a pane of information that's come out the window, which is late. So, um, and there is also one other type of, of pane, which is early, which we'll come to in a moment. But essentially, um, when a pane of information comes out of a window, there is two things that you can do with the data within that window. So once you've emitted the pane, you can choose to discard all the data that's in that window, or you can choose to keep it. Um, so uh, uh, the, the way that we describe that is discarding panes or accumulating. The default is to discard. So um, this is the reason why we had a value one here, but our count when the, the new late data item came was still only one instead of two, because when the first uh, pane came out, it was the, the, the values in that window have been discarded. In this uh, final one, they have been, um, uh, so we have a count of just one. In order to change this behavior, we can use accumulating panes. So here, we are going to add an accumulation mode to our code. Everything else is as before. Fixed window of one, allowed maintenance 10, and we're going to change this to accumulating mode. Now, when we run this, um, the other thing I'm going to do is change the way that we print information. Up until now, print pane info has been set to false for our, our, our get element timestamp class. Um, I do fun, sorry. And uh, now we say to true, we can actually see some extra information that was always available uh, for these elements. Again, I'm going to refer to this table rather than the raw data. Um, here we can see that uh, with the pane information, we're getting a first and last, whether it's the first pane in the window, whether it's the last pane in the window, and the timing. So all of these are on time, aside from this late uh, pane, which now is set to the value two. And this is because we are accumulating now instead of discarding, and we have the correct value. Please ignore this value, which is showing up here. Um, we are using the direct runner here, and the direct runner uh, Python triggering implementation stuff has got some known issues, and, and uh, I actually uh, talked to Pablo this morning about it, and we can uh, they are working on hopefully fixing this. So hopefully in the uh, later versions of the notebook, this won't be there. But for now, please just ignore this, this data point that's coming out. Essentially, this is uh, the same data point from previously being output again, which it shouldn't do. I won't actually go through this graphic. I, 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 after looking at it a bit, I don't think it, it does a great job of explaining anything. So we'll skip that. Um, so up until now, we've been dealing with uh, on-time um, uh, panes of information at the watermark. We've been dealing with <clears throat> late data. I mentioned there was another pane of information early. And to explore that, we're now going to get to triggers. Um, and uh, in terms of triggers, uh, to be able to show some of the three characteristics, we're going to make a little bit of a change to our uh, code. And instead of a one-second fixed window, we're going to use a five second fixed window. This gives us more elements in the window to play with. So the characteristics now change. So there's five elements in the window, which will start at zero and end just before five seconds. And we can ignore uh, the, the second window here. <clears throat> with this, uh, I'm gonna just, sorry, I'm just gonna have a little bit of water. Okay. So in this next um, piece, I'm actually going to use a trigger um, so we have our fixed window of five seconds, and we have a new uh, piece, which is a trigger after the watermark. Now, the after watermark trigger is actually the trigger we've been using throughout this process. So I'm just showing it here to show the syntax, and the output of this will be exactly the same as if I don't have the trigger here at all, because the after watermark and the discarding and the allowed maze of zero is the default position. Um, the output of this, as you would expect for the count operation, is that there's a count of five. Um, the the, the pain info is also all, all on time, so we have five, and we have that one element in that in that final window. So this is pretty much as before, um, and this has all been using the event time trigger. So after watermark is an event time trigger. 
The other type of triggers um, that we can make use of, uh, one of them is data driven. And here, if you imagine if you had a, a, a 12 hour window that you set up in a fixed window, uh, that's trying to count the number of um, uh, uh, activity that's going on with the machine. We may not want to wait 12 hours before we see that that machine suddenly had 500% more load than it normally would. We may want speculative results to come out the window. So we know they're not correct because the window hasn't closed, but we still want to see these results because we want to have a lower latency access to the information. If there's been a spike in load, then uh, we can do something about it downstream. Now, how do we do that? We do that with one way we do that is with a data driven trigger. Uh, the one we're going to use is after count. Now, what this does is rather than waiting on watermark, it's going to count at least n elements. If at least n elements arrive into the window, it's going to fire. I'm making sure to highlight at the at least point. Um, so it's not going to be exact. So if we set this to two, it won't uh, fire exactly when there is two, it will fire when there's two or more. So it could be, uh, if we go back up to our hing here, that because two arrived in this second window, it can either fire with the value two, because it sees these, or it could fire with the value three. Um, and so this is slightly non-deterministic. With the test stream, it's always going to produce, uh, I think, the same, same results. But uh, uh, just be aware uh, of that non-determinism when you use a data-driven trigger. Um, uh, the way that we put the syntax together, so there's a very nice uh, thing with the, the Python uh, after watermark trigger. You can compose other triggers directly with it. Um, so in this case, using the early E, uh, uh, we can provide an after count of three. So in other words, when there is three or more uh, uh, values that have entered the window, output a result. If we recall from before, when we didn't have this secondary trigger, we had a value of five and one. Uh, output in the table. When we run this now, we're going to have a value of three, five, and one. So this three, the pain information for that is early. In other words, this is a speculative result that is the result of after count triggering. Um, if we look at this uh, graphic here, we can see this a little bit more easily. So the after count trigger fired when there was three elements in the window, and we are not discarding, so we're accumulating. And then the watermark trigger fired at the uh, end of the window and the value was five. And then the, the, the final one is for the, the final window there. So data-driven triggers are one type of trigger. Another type of trigger is processing time triggers. So processing time triggers are basically based on the wall clock. And a, set, and a good example of this would be in our uh, use case where we had like 12 hours and we're waiting for values. Um, we can actually output a value every minute or every half hour if we wanted to. Uh, based on the actual processing time. Um, and you can also then compose multiple uh, triggers together. So in this particular case, we're making use of a trigger called after any. After, oh, didn't mean to do that. Didn't mean to do that, uh, sorry. So the after any will fire when any of the sub triggers within it uh, can fire. So here we have after any, and we've included two different triggers. So after processing time, so every three seconds, we're going to output from our window. Given our window is five seconds, that means it's only going to do it once anyway. Um, and the after count. So if either of these uh, triggers um, conditions are satisfied, it will uh, trigger. And of course, at the end, we're going to have the after watermark. Now, um, when we run this result, um, please note there is, as I said, uh, with the direct runner and, and the Python trigger stuff, there are some issues. Um, the processing time one is not firing. So here we're seeing the value three from the after count. We see the value two from the watermark. The reason it's two and not five is because we're using discarding in this use case and one. There should be one more line here, which is the processing time. Again, we've got to raise a JIRA on, on that. This is a direct runner uh, issue, we believe. And, and uh, uh, if you're running with Dataflow Runner or, or Flink Runner, then you shouldn't see that. You should actually see the, 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 the correct results. Um, how are we doing for time? Okay, I think we've got enough time to cover the next couple of pieces. Um, so another thing that people often do with data or processing time triggers is when they're interacting with the global window. So one of the properties of the global window that we saw very early on in this use case was the global window is uh, end is set to positive infinity in terms of what being those of time. Um, and Therefore, in a streaming world, if you put anything into the global window, 
and do something like an aggregation or a combined key, nothing will ever come out. And the reason for that is the watermark's never going to trigger because we're never going to get to infinity. If you then like shut down the pipeline with sort of a drain operation, et cetera, then you might get to infinity. But in normal operation, nothing is going to come out of that pipeline. There are use cases where you may want to make use of a global window. Uh, a very good one, I know Ken is doing a talk later on on state and time relay API, um, is where you need data to persist across uh, a, a large length of time in the state uh, API itself. Um, and so you might want to put data into the global window because of those uh, that case. There are other use cases as well, for example, with a slowly updating side input, which makes use of the, the global window. So how do we get information out of the global window? Well, um, as I said, the trick here is that Rather than using uh, the watermark uh, trigger, we need to make use of either processing time triggers or uh, uh, a data-driven trigger, which will then fire as, as data is coming in. In this case, we've reused the trigger that we used before. And when we run this, we're getting uh, the output we see below. One thing I just wanted to highlight on this output is, of course, the timestamp that's associated now with these values as we're, we're getting them output is, um, is is the end of the global window. Um, so be aware of that as you're doing this. There are ways around this. So when you're working with state and timer API, which Ken will talk about uh, in the session, two, two or three sessions after this one, um, the timer API, when that fires, it will associate the, the right timestamp to things. And then you can do another windowing afterwards. I won't go into the details here, but there are ways around this. Just be aware that by default, the global window, the, 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 the timestamp that you see here is going to be the one that's attached. Another important thing about the global window, what's coming out, because it's data-driven or processing time-driven, there's going to be no order, right? So um, it, it's, it's completely random order what will come out of that window uh, based off the data going into it. So with triggers, we are able to choose completeness, so uh, making sure we have all of the data before we do an output. Uh, we can go for latency, um, so lower latency by outputting data just based on the count of number of elements going in or, or processing time, or we can do it based off of cost. So one thing um, when we were talking about accumulating mode, in accumulating mode, if you choose accumulating mode, um, uh, accumulating rather than discarding, and you have a low latency trigger, then Imagine you've got a window that's one hour long and you've got um, a couple of hundred thousand QPS or 10,000 QPS, let's keep 10,000. You have 10,000 QPS. Um, every time elements coming in, you're firing elements and keeping everything there. So the amount of data here coming out is going to, I believe it uh, uh, gets N squared, right? Um, so uh, you're doing a lot more processing uh, for that. And that's one of the cost considerations that you have control about. You can either use um, uh, you can use discarding in that uh, example for uh, so that you are not continuously uh, increasing the volume of data that you're having to process based off a small amount of data coming in or not small but a reasonable amount of data coming in. Um, the uh, final piece, and I think we have enough time to cover this, is around merging windows. Um, so for merging windows, um, uh, this is based off this is a data driven uh, window. And uh, uh, events coming from, so um, for this particular use case, we need to change the uh, test data a little bit. Um, in our test stream, rather than using our stock data, I'm gonna use clickstream data. Uh, so with the, uh, uh, the, the session window, which is the merging window, we've got, um, uh, we're going to pretend that we've got a application where uh, I as a user have done some browsing and made a purchase. And then later on, I've gone in and done some administration. Um, so this is the, the test stream that we've created, browse, browse, purchase based off of these times. And then I'm doing some administration. Um, with the session window, what it does is it will uh, allow us to output based on uh, the gap um, uh, uh, between the data. So uh, what we've done is be window sessions, um, nine seconds. I should have probably put an hour here. I'm sorry about that. But essentially, uh, what this will do is it's going to wait to see if there's a gap in the data coming in for a particular session, for a particular key. If there is uh, a gap of nine seconds, then it's going to output the results. So what this um, allows us to do with this data set that we have, and I've given a key of ID one, is um, because these three events 
were close together, and then there is a nine second gap. Uh, the output of this is going to be two separate sessions. So in other words, it's done the sessionization for us for the clickstream. Um, I was on doing a browsing and then I made a purchase, that becomes one session. I later on then did some administration, that becomes another session. So when we run this, we get these two values uh, that are output from the uh, session window. Uh, okay, and uh, uh, with that, we've come to the end of, of this piece. Um, we can move on to questions and uh, stuff if there are any.